thank you very much for continuing to join us and, and share this information with uh, residents across our area. Uh, so the format for today uh, will be the same as previous sessions. I'll start with an overview of the epidemiology or essentially the numbers uh, associated with COVID-19 activity. I'll uh, touch on vaccination updates uh, and then uh, a couple of final comments just about public health measures before we open up for questions. Uh, so to start with, in terms of the data piece, I, I know I always start with the same sentence, which is uh, uh, the total number of cases we've had to date in the pandemic. Uh, but I'm not actually going to do that today because we know that the, the number on our dashboard of the confirmed number of cases really is no longer uh, an accurate reflection of what uh, the activity of COVID-19 is in the community. Uh, we're continuing to, to share this, this number uh, in this data point on our COVID-19 dashboard. Uh, I think certainly we're still seeing higher numbers associated with it, which certainly means that uh, there is ongoing COVID-19 transmission uh, and infection happening uh, across all three of our geographic areas. Uh, but the absolute number itself uh, is not reflective of, of overall activity. I will share that uh, uh, we know that when testing uh, became limited uh, for PCR testing, uh, we did see a significant drop off in terms of the number of confirmed cases that were being reported. And this uh, has impacted our incidence rate. So our incidence rate is a reflection of by population number. Uh, but we have seen over the last week really that this drop uh, is uh, has plateaued a bit. So at our peak uh, or the highest incidence rate we've had, we were about we were above 500 cases per 100,000. The last week we've remained around 250 cases per 100,000, sometimes a little bit below, sometimes a bit above. I, I believe today we're at 270 cases per 100,000. So we know that, that that overall incidence rate is an underestimate, uh, but what we are seeing is that it's kind of stabilized and staying at about that rate. When we look to neighboring jurisdictions that are starting potentially to see some early signs that uh, activity might be starting to at least peak and potentially decrease, um, I think that we should expect that we'll see activity across our region uh, start to peak, if not plateau, and then decrease over the next week or so, which is which is really in line with what provincial modeling had uh, had anticipated. I, just to put the, those incidence rate uh, numbers in perspective, uh, as a reminder, if you're a visual person, um, uh, prior to Omicron, uh, we were sitting at about five to six cases per 100,000 population. At the peak of uh, the third wave uh, in, in last spring, early summer, we were at about 90 cases per 100,000. So plateauing and staying about the same uh, is, is at around 250 cases per 100,000 is certainly still much higher activity uh, than we have seen in, at any previous time in this pandemic. So I've mentioned at some of our, our previous media information sessions about other indicators that we're starting to look at to tell us uh, about overall COVID-19 activity in the community. One Another indicator that uh, we're continuing to follow is test positivity. And our test positivity has also really uh, um, reached kind of a point that it's staying about the same, which is around 12 to 13% certainly much better than 22-23%, uh, which we were a couple of weeks ago, uh, but also certainly much higher than the 2-3% to we were seeing prior to the Omicron wave. Throughout this wave and really throughout the pandemic, uh, the HKPR jurisdiction numbers have been slightly lower than the, pro the province. So I understand that the provincial test positivity rate is at about 18% now. Uh, so our rate is lower than the provincial rate, but certainly um, uh, is still higher than, uh, than what we've seen prior to this wave. Another data indicator which uh, we've not talked a lot about across HKPR uh, but has been available in other jurisdictions is wastewater surveillance data. 
the reason that uh, we haven't talked a lot about it across HKPR as of yet uh, is because we were one of the health units to receive um, this type of uh, this uh, wastewater surveillance um, system or, or setup later. So it only became established just uh, in the fall. Uh, and they're not as meaningful for uh, rural health units with broad geographies. I think they very, very useful for large urban centers that uh, where the virus activity in wastewater can really signal um, uh, what's happening in a, in a denser population. But in a jurisdiction like HKPR, we know that there's large portions of our geography that might not be on a wastewater system. They might be on a septic system. And we can't have the technology in every municipal wastewater plant. At this point in time, we do have it uh, in two locations uh, and that we're monitoring. So one in Lindsay, where we're able to water uh, virus signals in the sewer shed for Lindsay. And then the other location is in Coburg. Uh, right now, there's about a seven day lag time uh, between when the sample is taken and then when we are able to get the data. Uh, so it's not the t a type of uh, data point that we're following day to day because there is that lag uh, signal. However, what it has been showing uh, is that uh, really five to six days before we might see case numbers change, we are seeing a change in that wastewater signal. Certainly back in December, uh, as Omicron uh, became the dominant variant uh, throughout Ontario and then into HKPR, we saw the wastewater viral signals uh, increase significantly in both Lindsay and Coburg. At this point in time, uh, the signal in Lindsay appears to have come down a little bit. I think it is too early to tell whether or not this is uh, a trend that is going to stay uh, or if it's coming down to a plateau. Um, and again, this is this reflects data as of last week because we do have a, a lag time from when we get the data. The wastewater viral signal in Coburg um, is has stayed about the same. It hasn't, at least as of last week, wasn't yet showing uh, an indication that it was decreasing as of yet. So I, I'm sharing that data today because I know that uh, it's something that's asked about in many other health unit jurisdictions. I think it, it's one tool in our toolbox. Uh, less useful for us here across our region uh, for a number of different reasons, uh, but still one of the things to consider. The other indicators that uh, we're continuing to closely follow really have more to do with uh, outcomes associated with severe illness of COVID-19. Uh, so we speak about data related to hospital admissions, admissions to ICU uh, and deaths uh, as a result of COVID-19 infection. Uh, the data, so we, we've gone back and compiled or summarized the data from January 1st of this year, so reflects about the last three and a half weeks or so of data where we were in full Omicron wave. So since January 1st, we've had 39 admissions to hospital uh, from COVID-19. We've had 12 admissions to ICU and we've had nine deaths from COVID-19. Now, this is certainly the, the highest numbers uh, of hospital admissions uh, and uh, ICU admissions than we've seen throughout the pandemic. Uh, currently, as of, as of today, uh, we have 20 individuals or 20 residents across HKPR admitted to hospital with 10 in the ICU. What's different about the Omicron wave compared to say the first wave of the pandemic was the first wave of the pandemic, we didn't have any vaccines. Uh, and we found that our, our most elderly residents, especially those in long-term care homes and retirement homes um, were, were significantly impacted with some homes seeing very high mortality from COVID-19. We have had, uh, so of those nine deaths since January 1st, four of those are associated with, are of residents in a long-term care home. So it's not that Omicron is a totally mild illness. Uh, it can cause severe illness, but we have other measures in place that are also helping to prevent uh, that same uh, 
uh, severity of illness and death that we saw with the first wave of the pandemic. And so I think that that's, you know, a, a positive light uh, in throughout all of this. I, I know that there's uh, there's often questions about characteristics associated with uh, hospital admissions. So among the, those uh, 39 residents uh, admitted to hospital since January the 1st, 49% or almost half of those uh, individuals had not received uh, any vaccinations. Uh, and so that's while um, representing almost 50% of hospital admissions, only 10 to 15% of the population is, uh, is not vaccinated. So certainly still a higher risk of needing admission to hospital uh, if someone is, is unvaccinated. We're also continuing to see more hospital admissions among older age groups. So 53% uh, of hospital admissions as, uh, associated with uh, residents that are age 70 and over. We have had two hospital admissions uh, for those under the age of 20, which is also, um, I think, unique. Uh, it, it's uncommon for this region. Uh, we have not had many pediatric hospitalizations throughout the pandemic. Uh, and there's certainly, there's no evidence that this is causing more severe illness in children. Uh, but if we do the math, if there's more infection, even if it's a relatively rare, uh, rare event, uh, it might happen more often with Omicron. In terms of ICU admissions, uh, of those 12 individuals, 67% were unvaccinated uh, and 41% uh, uh, over the age 70 and above. Uh, and the vast majority, so 80% of ICU admissions among individuals age 60 and over. Um, so I will, I'll pause there uh, for the update on epidemiology or COVID-19 activity. I'm sure I will have missed uh, a, a point of interest and so happy to answer questions. Uh, but I will move to some updates around vaccination. Uh, as vaccination against COVID-19 continues to be one of the most important tools that we have uh, to try and prevent uh, severe outcomes associated with COVID-19 and to try and uh, uh, blunt the impact of Omicron's uh, very, very high level in, of infectiousness uh, on our the impact on our acute care system or our hospitals, essentially. So among the population that is age 70 and over, as of Monday this week, 79% had received their booster dose. Uh, for those age 50 and over, 66% had received their booster dose. And for those individuals age 18 and over, 53.6% had received their booster dose uh, for a COVID-19 vaccine. For the age group that is 5 to 11, uh, we know that eligibility for COVID-19 vaccine uh, just happened at the beginning of December, end of November. Uh, and so we're really only reporting um, or following closely the statistic of uh, coverage for first dose. Uh, and I've spoken previously about how this coverage really has plateaued and is now seeing really only incremental increases from week to week. So as of Monday this week, 44.8%, uh, so just about 45% five, uh, uh, among kids aged 5 to 11 had received their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine. So continuing with that incremental increase from week to week. A couple of key announcements just related to access to vaccines. So uh, usual avenues are available. We have the health unit led clinics at numerous sites throughout uh, our three main geographic regions. Uh, there's several primary care teams that are continuing to offer vaccination. Uh, we have pharmacies that are also offering vaccination. At health unit health unit led clinics, uh, uh, we are now uh, welcoming and accepting walk-ins uh, for any age and for any dose uh, in afternoons only at our clinics. So uh, this could be for five to eleven year olds their first dose. It could be for a, a seventeen year old for their second dose, or it could be for a fifty year old for their booster dose. Uh, so any age for any dose in the afternoon. Afternoons. Um, at, we have continued to see a decrease uh, in a number of people booking appointments. This isn't a surprise. We saw the same thing last summer as we achieved a higher vaccination coverage uh, with second doses. 
Uh, so we we are continuing with the strategy of as we see appointments decrease, we expand uh, with walk-in availability, and then we look at what other tools we have uh, to try and continue to increase uptake of vaccine. There is good data coming out of both uh, other jurisdictions, including the United States, as well as Canada, related to the increased protection you get with a booster dose against uh, both symptomatic infection as well as severe illness. And so while before really we referred to fully vaccinated as two doses, to be fully protected right now, uh, really we need individuals to receive their booster dose when they're eligible. And this will continue to help prevent people from being admitted to hospital uh, and or the ICU. If people uh, don't want to walk in, certainly there are, are still appointments available to be booked in the provincial booking system. Uh, and uh, you just need to go to the, the website, uh, very easy to, to go on and, and book an appointment at any of the locations. Uh, I'm anticipating there might be questions uh, at, about school related clinics as this has been a, a bit of a hot topic related to, from provincial media sources. Uh, we are working closely with uh, our regional school boards. So we, we have three uh, school boards that we work with across our jurisdiction uh, and we're working with them to identify which schools would be a good fit for a school based vaccination clinic uh, and then what kind of the features of that clinic would be uh, and really uh, relying on our partners and the boards to help uh, determine and define the parameters of that clinic. There might be some clinics uh, where the school boards are saying that it's all right for parents to come in for their, their child's appointment. Uh, and then there are other school boards that uh, would prefer that parents not come into the school for, for other, region, uh, sorry, other reasons. Uh, but for any appointment or any uh, clinic that's happening at the school setting, uh, parental consents uh, will be obtained uh, both ahead of time and then certainly if they're present confirming at uh, the time of the appointment. And uh, I think otherwise, why don't I, I stop there, uh, as I'm sure that there are things that I haven't covered as of yet. Um, I'd like to remind everybody uh, about the continued need for public health measures. Uh, vaccination, incredibly important tool, uh, but also all of those other public health measures, including masking, including distancing and avoiding gatherings outside of your household as much as possible right now, especially indoors. Um, uh, and continuing with all of these measures that uh, uh, we've become so good at over the last two years. Uh, so thank you again for joining and happy to answer some questions today. Thanks as always Dr. Bocking for that update, uh, very informative. Um, we'll turn it over to the media for questions if you wanted to uh, raise your hand or just type something into the chat box. Um, please uh, go ahead. Um, I would just ask whoever joined us if they could just turn off their video. That would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, I don't see unless um, you are Dr. Bocking. I don't. Oh, here we go. Jessica, do you want to go ahead with your first set of questions? Sure. Thank you, Bill. Hi, Dr. Bocking. Thanks for the update. Hi, Jessica. Um, hey. When did the um, the walk in access start? Because I know you were having online booking for a long time, so that's changed. When, when did that start? So last week we opened up for walk ins to 50 plus, uh, and I believe that started last Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, and then broader opening to all ages essentially is starting today, <laughs> tomorrow. So we'll be, uh, I think Bill will be sending out a media release shortly that people will have kind of that written detail to accompany it. So you haven't missed out on anything, don't worry. Okay, and as far as the school clinics go, you know, you mentioned that there's kind of been a plateau that kids, it seems, are not you know that sorry i'm not wording this well there's been a there's been kind of a plateau with youth um so why do you think that school clinics are necessary if you're not getting the numbers in your regular clinics well so that that's a good question jessica because i think there is um uh 
a healthy skepticism of whether or not school-based clinics will significantly increase the uptake. Um, it, it might, uh, and I think we certainly want to ensure that access is as easy as possible for, uh, for parents. Uh, and we know that schools, um, you know, are considered a community space uh, and, uh, you know, supporting overall child well-being. However, a, a number of parental surveys uh, done through other health units, other jurisdictions have, have indicated that uh, the plateauing really is not an issue of access to vaccine, but more of an issue of confidence uh, by parents in the vaccine itself. This is a new vaccine. With any new vaccines, um, parents take a little bit longer before they trust uh, that they'd like their children to receive it. Uh, and we've seen that with other childhood vaccines. This isn't something that's specific to COVID-19. Um, I think, I mean, school-based clinics might provide additional opportunities for education uh, and that sort of thing. So I think we want to continue with multiple strategies. Uh, I don't know that we'll see a very dramatic increase uh, following school-based clinics, but would be very pleasantly surprised if we do. Excellent. Thanks, Dr. Bocking. I'll move to the back of the line. Thanks, Jessica. Um, next up, we have uh, Catherine um, to ask her questions. Go ahead, Catherine. Good afternoon, Dr. Bocking. Um, I, I know this question was asked of, of uh, you as well as uh, the, the other two uh, medical officers of local medical officers of health uh, during last night's uh, KPR meeting, KPR meeting, no, PVNC meeting. Um, one of those meetings yeah. last night. <laughs> um, and it, it's a question of the 30% threshold. Uh, at what, where, where is the balancing act in, in regards to that uh, before a school does declare a closure? Is it is it 30% of students? Is it 30% of staff? Is it a combination of both? Um, because as, as one trustee pointed out, 30% at a school with, uh, with 1,200 students is different from a school that has 250 students. Hmm. Yeah, and, and I think there's a there's a number of things to consider related to absenteeism reporting. So one is that um, essentially my message is if a school is concerned, it doesn't matter what percent you're at, connect with public health. Uh, so you don't have to wait to 30 percent. 30 percent isn't a, a magical number. So if you're concerned, we should be talking about it already. Um, the other thing is that that 30% uh, is not necessarily specific to COVID-19 illness. Uh, so I think it's important to, with each of the, the school boards and schools, uh, to tease out why exactly we think that that absenteeism is, is happening. Certainly beyond, you know, buses being cancelled, snow days, um, other illnesses like a GI outbreaks, that sort of thing. So really trying to tease out what exactly might be at the root of that. And I think that speaks to the need for, you know, if, if a school reports and if a school is concerned that we're having that dialogue and that conversation about what we think is going on, what we think the risks are to children and to staff, that we've reviewed uh, to all of our other protective measures to ensure that they're all optimized the best that they can be. So cohorting, masking, cleaning, all of these other things. Uh, and then determining kind of, so what are the numbers showing? Is this only a couple, all grade one classes? Is it throughout the school? So I don't think there can be one bl blanket answer as to what the response will be. I think the key is that we're working together with the boards to get at what the route is and then what the goal is. What do we need to do to um, ensure that uh, we're preventing transmission as much as really is possible at this point in time. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Okay, um, okay thanks Catherine. Um, I see um, Sue from uh, Halliburton. Go ahead. 
Hi, Dr. Bocking. Thanks, Bill. Um, my question is about the pediatric hospitalizations you mentioned. Are you able to share with us the age of those patients? Uh, so I don't actually know what the age is, Sue. I know that there was one uh, under the age of 10 uh, and then one in the age group of 11 to, to 19 or 10 to 19, but I don't know the actual age or sex or uh, geographical location. Okay, thanks. And um, my other question is just about testing. So um, uh, based on, on the dashboard, it appears that some kids are, are being able to access PCR tests. And I just think I need some clarification around, is that um, because they attend school or because they live in a high risk setting or is it open to kids in the general population? Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question, Sue, and, and I don't know the exact reason behind the numbers on the dashboard. Um, at this point in time, uh, it's PCR testing is not open widely to all kids attending school or childcare. Uh, there were some schools that might have had the PCR take home tests uh, that were distributed through the Ministry of Education to schools prior to the holiday break. And those take home PCR swabs uh, were, if their school still has them, can be given out to either kids or staff if they become symptomatic at school. Uh, though they do the self swab, they can drop it off at uh, an assessment center. And then that is included in our overall numbers because it's still a PCR swab. The other scenario where uh, kids might be included is if they're in a household with a healthcare worker uh, that might be working at a long-term care home or a or a hospital, um, and uh, and that uh, care provider or household member needing to know whether or not this is COVID in the household or whether it's not COVID in the household. So there's some provisions uh, related to health household members uh, that work in highest risk settings. Uh, and then the other the other point you make is related to congregate settings. If these are, are kids that might be at a congregate setting, uh, there's none that I'm aware of right now that have been significantly impacted by COVID-19. So I don't know that that's the driver behind it, but certainly one of the other possibilities. Perfect, thanks. Thanks, uh, Sue. Go ahead, Jessica, with your uh, set of questions. Thanks, Bill. I was just curious about the wastewater treatment, Dr. Bocking, because we had talked about it quite a bit in Peterborough a while ago. So w when uh, you said in the fall, I believe it was established, um, but when did you start reporting on it? And yeah, I may have missed that. No, so uh, so Catherine, you haven't, or sorry, Jessica, you haven't, <laughs> you haven't missed anything related to this. Uh, um, we are not reporting on it publicly on our dashboard because there is the data lag and because we're really not doing day to day uh, changes. It's really just in the last uh, two weeks or so that we've tried to start incorporating it more. We didn't start to actually receive any reports at all on it until late fall. Uh, and then at that point in time, we were still working with uh, the systems and the kind of data visualization hub, which is hosted with the province uh, to ensure that any of the, um, the issues were worked out, ensuring the data was accurate uh, and ensuring that we were interpreting it correctly to be able to, to share. Um, it's a bit different. I know Peterborough has had a relationship with local researchers at Trent, uh, and I think some of the other some other health units that have used it um, as a more integral part of their surveillance system have had uh, partnerships with other universities. Our, we're accessing this service really through uh, through provincial supports, uh, and our samples actually go to Hamilton to McMaster to be processed and analyzed. So, a little bit a uh, little bit different, um, but really pleased to see that we're starting to incorporate some of this information, even though it does have its its caveats. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, lastly, I was just seeing that you have a. Uh, go bus. Do you have vaccination in, in Halliburton through a go bus? So the go the go vax has been up to Halliburton a couple of times. Um, I don't want to three or four times now. Um, there's a couple of locations across our, our jurisdictions that the go vax bus has. We've been fortunate that it's been able to to drive up and visit. So. Uh, 
I don't actually know what date that is, but if you're seeing it on our, it will be on our website. Okay, my colleague just sent it to me that it's on our website, so I just didn't realize that was happening. Um, anyway, that's it for me. Thank you very much, Dr. Bocking. Appreciate your time and the update. Thanks, Jessica. And if you do need those dates, I can send those to you. Just, uh, just let me know. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'd appreciate that. Okay, I'll make a note. Um, now, uh, I guess we'll turn it over to Catherine again for another set of questions. Okay, um, my question is in regards to the uh, the COVID assessment center that's running at the Victoria Park Armory uh, by the Ross Morrow Hospital. In in what way is is this assisting the health unit uh, with its data, uh, if at all? So, so interesting question, Catherine. I mean, it, it assists with our data because that is the core location in CKL that is offering PCR testing. So uh, that's where the PCR testing is being, or the swabbing for PCR testing is being done. Uh, there's not other specific uh, data points that we collect through the hospital on the assessment center other than the number of uh, tests really that are being done there. Uh, otherwise, the assessment centers have been kind of funded, governed, operated uh, outside of public health largely, uh, but by Ontario Health and through uh, different healthcare partners. So in with them moving it from the hospital to a publicly funded facility like the Armory. Uh, do you see that as, as beneficial to, to people or would, would people be more likely to have their sim symptoms assessed in a hospital setting? I, so, so I don't, I don't know. Um, I think that there's certainly, we can think of people going in other jurisdictions to private labs that offer testing outside of hospitals. Uh, we know that the province had made uh, some testing available through pharmacies. So I think the idea of testing being offered outside of hospitals is, isn't is kind of new or unique. Um, I think the key is, is that the hospital has been able to figure out a good space to make that work um, uh, in a way that keeps the hospital functioning uh, and to ensure that people have access to it. Um, I think, uh, I mean, you'll you'll probably know better than I in terms of accessibility, whether it's by transit or other things, uh, which I know HK Perth doesn't have a ton of transit in general um, uh, to access different locations. So so there's different, uh, I think, different considerations that uh, that the uh, Ross Memorial Hospital would have made in deciding where the best location was. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Catherine. Um, we're, uh, this feels like Groundhog Day early because we have the same set of questioners coming up, but it's Sue's turn, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Um, Dr. Bocking, can you speak to what's happening right now with people protesting vaccine mandates? So there's the, um, obviously the, the trucker convoy that we're hearing about, and I think possibly a growing voice uh, uh, regarding vaccine mandates in Ontario and, and within Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so I can speak a little bit to it in that I, I know that uh, that it's there. I, it's hard to know whether or not it's growing. I think that um, that we've we've seen certainly protests not just with vaccine mandates or other public health measures, but uh, for other things throughout history um, that people will will choose to demonstrate against. Um, I think what's what has been a bit disconcerting for some, uh, certainly in the healthcare field, is is protests moving from public spaces to private properties uh, uh, or to individual houses, that sort of thing. And I, I think that's a, a very concerning feature, um, one that's not appropriate. Uh, I think it, the the demonstrations that we're seeing kind of uh, at other public locations, they might continue. Um, uh, and I think we continue to have respectful dialogue on uh, on things that we uh, are challenged with. 
Thank you. And regarding uh, child vaccinations, have you heard about the possibility of a third booster being recommended by Pfizer for some kids, potentially kids, I suppose, who have, um, are immunocompromised or? Uh, yes, so we have uh, actually the National Advisory Committee on Immunization just released an updated statement recommending for children aged 5 to 11 that have certain uh, medical conditions that compromise their immune system uh, that they receive the third dose of the pediatric Pfizer vaccine. Similar to what we saw with adults that had immune compromising conditions that two doses of vaccine does not get the same response uh, compared to those people with fully functioning immune systems and so a third dose is needed. So NASI did just come out uh, yesterday, two days ago with with that statement. Uh, and I know the province will be looking at um, enabling that here for kids that that might apply to. Excellent, thank you. Bill, can I ask one more question? <sighs> yeah, you can. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, also, Dr. Bocking, I was just wondering if you have um, any sort of statement or um, anything you'd like to share from a public health perspective on mental health, uh, just given the day, there's a lot of people talking about it um, and just the stage that we're in in the pandemic. I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to share that you thought the public might um, benefit from hearing. Mm. Thanks, Sue. It is it is Let's Talk Day, um, and thank you for flagging that. And really, now more than ever is a time to be aware of mental health. Um, we know that this pandemic has had so many negative impacts on all facets of people's lives, uh, uh, contributing to um, to challenges with mental with mental wellness, mental health, uh, and then an increase in mental health conditions across our communities. I think one of the things that is most important about today and Let's Talk Day is is acknowledging the stigma associated with mental health conditions talking about the stigma associated with mental health conditions and helping then hopefully to eliminate the stigma associated with mental health conditions. We And sorry, so you'll have to probably interrupt me and get me to stop talking uh, about mental health, but, I, but we know that uh, stigma contributes significantly to uh, ongoing really suffering by individuals with mental health conditions. And uh, I think all of us have have a role to play in creating the space for not just individuals impacted by their own mental health condition, but uh, by family members, friends, community members to, to create that space where they feel safe and welcome and acknowledged and uh, don't have a fear associated with sharing their, their challenges associated with mental health. I think the most important thing we can all be doing right now is continue to be kind to each other, uh, to acknowledge that uh, we all have challenges uh, in many different areas of our lives uh, and we're all doing the best that we can to continue to get through this pandemic. Thanks so much and thanks Bill for the third question, I appreciate it. My wife says I sigh too much and I think I saw that on the video when I had it on, so uh, no, no, no problem. Um, is there anybody else who has any further questions for Dr. Bocking? I'm going to say going once, going twice. Mandy Martin is now exiting. Okay, I guess that's uh, maybe a sign that we should also exit. We do appreciate your participation and questions, all good, and we certainly appreciate Dr. Bocking's time to provide an update uh, on COVID in our community. Um, really good information. We will see you again in seven days time and uh, until then, thanks for your time and uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Dr. Bocking. Thanks, great. Dr. Thank Bocking. You. Thanks, Bill. Take care, everyone.